1990, the superior of the Jesuits of Leeson Street in Dublin asked the art historian Sergio Benedetti to examine this painting, which hang in the living room of their community. Few years after, a long research could demonstrate that this painting is the original Caravaggio's taking of Christ, which was lost since generations. The work was commissioned to Caravaggio in 1602 by one member of the Roman family Mattei, where the Lombard painter was hosted at that time. The Mattei family sold the work at the beginning of the 19th century, and it arrived in the British Islands, where it was sold several times under a false attribution. In the 30s, it was donated by an Irish pediatrician to the Jesuit Fathers in Dublin. Today, the work is permanently exposed in the National Gallery of Ireland. The iconographical model for Caravaggio was probably a woodcut made in 1509 by Albrecht Dürer, but the interpretation of Caravaggio has several suggestive characteristics that I would like to highlight. First, Caravaggio creates an aggressive movement by the direction of the gazes towards Jesus, by the tension of the arms, by the inclination of the bodies, and by the crowding of the figures. It's a real, a real assault on Jesus. And Jesus is really the focus of this whole oppressing violence. Second, the instant which is here photographed by Caravaggio is the peak of the dramatic tension. Probably Judas just kissed Jesus. That's why the soldiers can now identify him and grasp him. The movement of the head of Judas is then just a bit coming back from the physical contact with the face of Jesus. He just lost Jesus forever. And that's why he tries to hold him still with his arms like in a disparate contradiction. The most intimate expression of relationship, which is a kiss, turns to the worst destruction of the relationship which is a betrayal. Beyond Judas' intentions, both heads are united, like in the intimacy of a veil formed by the mantle of the fleeing disciple, grasped by the hands of one of the soldiers. Whereas Judas looks poignantly at Jesus, Jesus looks down like in a sort of modesty, which retains to look at the betrayer. The red drape gives not only like a tender protection, but also a sort of liturgical frame here. To put one's own mouth on some object is actually the literally translation of the Latin word ad oratio, adoration. Betrayal is here transfigured in adoration. The fleeing disciple is often identified, because of his young age, with John, the beloved disciple. He could also represent every disciple, since they all escaped in this very moment. But the head of this young man is like melted with the head of Jesus. This figure can be seen as a sort of psychological shadow of Jesus. Somehow it's the representation of the fear Jesus has just expressed in his anxious prayer on the Garden of Olives. This young man 
is a choice Jesus didn't take. At the same time, the text of Mark's Gospel speaks of a young man covered by a sheet who was grasped and escaped leaving the sheet that now in Caravaggio's painting embraces liturgically Jesus and Judas. At the lower part of the canvas, we observe the hands of Jesus in a gesture of abandon and resignation. Hands like that cannot grasp anything else. At the same time, these hands are like the overturning of the gesture of hands in prayer. This arrest happens exactly after the prayer of Jesus. Or we could say this arrest is a continuation of the prayer of self-giving that Jesus was doing sweeting blood. The prayer is here like open to action. The history is entering in the prayer of Jesus. The interlaced fingers are like an echo to the interlaced arms on the upper part of the picture. Actually, the left hand of Jesus, at our right, seems to come from a mysterious place in the dark center of the canvas, which is a bit too far away from the realistic end of the hidden arm of Jesus. So, this left hand of Jesus is the whole humankind now interlaced with Jesus' life and just presented together to the Father in the prayer of Gethsemane. In this movement of interlaced arms, the geometric center of the painting and the foremost plan of the picture is occupied by the officer's highly polished metal-clad arm. Some scholar has understood this surprising element as the suggestion of a mirror, where the observer can recognize himself inside the scene, but it is also an extremely graphic representation of what was called secular arm of the religious authorities. That reinforces the identification character of this element if we think of the Matei family and at the Roman context where Caravaggio was. Seventh point. On the upper right corner of the painting, Caravaggio depicted a self-portrait in a man holding a lantern in an effort to observe the scene. Caravaggio was about 31 years old at that time. Some scholars associated this gesture to the image of Diogenes, the Greek philosopher who, as provocation, was looking for a human being walking with a lantern in the central square of his town. We could deduce that Caravaggio is searching Christ like Diogenes searched the humanity, or that Caravaggio searches the humanity searching Christ. But if we observe the way this man is holding the lantern, we notice that it is not a normal way to hold solidly a lantern. Much more, this gesture corresponds exactly to the position of the painter holding the paintbrush. It's, of course, Caravaggio himself painting the scene. But painting becomes here enlightening, which is exactly the way Caravaggio paints, probably in a dark room with a complicated system of lighting. His works show figures which light make rise out of the darkness, a light often interpret interpreted as the divine grace. In our work, the lantern of Caravaggio doesn't cast light on the scene. Observe the back of the head of Judas it should receive full light from the lantern, but doesn't. It is as if the attempt of Caravaggio to depict the taking of Christ were, were useless. He is not able to enlighten Jesus. He is not able to depict him. He is not able to take him. In fact, Caravaggio's self-portrait is on the side of the capturers. To paint is his way to capture. 
or even to betray Jesus. Painting is Caravaggio's adoration. The painter cannot grasp Jesus in his own powerless light, but is himself enlightened, not by his own lantern, but by the same light that embraces the whole scene and creates the figures. Trying to light Christ, he was lighted himself. In his betrayal, he discovers himself as adorer. Dear Living Stones and friends, in our time of COVID-19, to grasp, to hug, to kiss are gestures that speak a lot to us. These gestures, which were normally life-giving, could now bring death. This new situation reveals something which was always true, the ambiguity of our closest relationships, the superficiality of our signs of friendship. When we will embrace again each other, we will be fully aware of the responsibility of our relationships. The life of the others is in our hands, like in this picture. At the same, at the same time, as living stones, we are always in an attempt to describe Jesus, to make him visible to others. We are like the self-portrait of Caravaggio on the side of the sinners, trying something impossible like depicting God. But in this very effort, we are enlightened by the divine light. We come out from the darkness. Our lantern, which is our volunteering, our explanations to the visitors, is often disappointing and unable to illuminate, but during this effort, the whole scene is enlightened by a surprising light from somewhere else, which embraces ourselves as first and makes us aware of the adorable mystery of every encounter.